Okay, I'm back. This is getting lengthy, and I apologize for that, but it's the nature of college. It's the nature of remote learning, and here we go. So um, we talked about a priori ideas. We talked about practical ideas. We talked about uh, being impelled, compelled to leap to judgment. The fact that we don't always agree, but uh, that we nevertheless feel a similar investment in certain objects of debate, and that uh, this leads us into conflict, which doesn't have to be an unhealthy thing. Debate in uh, society, which uh, wants to maintain itself, and yet allow for the type of flexibility that will allow for uh, adaptation to new circumstances, new creations, new concepts, it's going to have to debate. Uh, and so uh, this, this is what Kant is mostly interested in. And what most gets from Kant is the idea that this goes on not just in so-called civilized societies, but it goes on in some of uh, the archaic, well, in archaic societies of the sort that Mose is interested in as a sociologist, as an anthropologist. So um, now what we're going to do is look at uh, some of the fundamental forms of debating in uh, the cultures that most looks at, and we're also going to look at some modern debates. So uh, one of the debates in the study of uh, cultures based in magic is going to be regarding the identity, the nature, or I'll say the credulity of the person who's doing the magic. And this boils down to, it, it traces back to a group of people uh, working in Cambridge uh, late into the 19th century. So these are the immediate precursors to most. They're a group called the Cambridge Ritualists, and they're essentially scholars of religion, world religion, uh, and it is a field which is relatively new. People prior to this had studied religion for devotional reasons, or they had studied it out of curiosity, but it, it had never really been turned into a respectable academic discipline. Religion was just something to, um, in a polemical fashion, either tear down, because you were a member of the Radical Enlightenment, or to defend vigorously because you were still a faithful Christian. So uh, we got into all kinds of polemics over religion, but nobody stood back and tried to understand it objectively as an essentially, uh, and as a universal human phenomenon. The, the person who gets all of this going is a German scholar by the name of Max Müller. He comes over to uh, England, Cambridge, and starts up the, uh, what we'd call the first modern, secular, non-polemical, uh, School of Religious Studies, and uh, his disciples are going to be these Cambridge ritualists. Uh, what they're trying to do in so many words is interpret texts um, in a way different from people, from what people had normally done. So if you read religious texts in the past, uh, the text was the bedrock out of which you tried to extrapolate either what the past looked like or what correct doctrine or what correct practice was like, but everything goes back to its grounding in the written text. And what these people are trying to say is, no, as a matter of fact, you can go below the text. The text isn't the bedrock. The text is the first strata. Maybe it's even the second or third strata removed, but if we want to go back to the most fundamental basics of religion, it's not going to be based in any written work. It's going to be based in ritual. And the ritual, uh, once it has been abstracted and cut off from human 
interaction ritual of the sort that I said. Now we're going to have scripture, but scripture uh, comes after the fact, and what we want to try to do is read text in such a way that we can reconstruct um, imaginatively or with the help of archaeological evidence empirically, but one way or the other, speculatively, what the original uh, rituals looked like. Uh, so they're very much interested in, in what I was saying earlier about uh, interaction ritual. Uh, but if we're going to think about ritual, ritual involves different people performing different roles, whether it's the priest or whether it's the parishioner, whether it's the um, shaman or whether it's somebody seeking the shaman's help or somebody who's intermediary between the two, there's various social roles that need to be played and uh, in order to understand them better we should define them, reduce them down to their essence. So the debate's going to arise, um, okay, as uh, societies, as cultures get more information, as they have more experiences, it's going to uh, become obvious to certain people that uh, the spells that magicians claim to be performing don't actually work. And little by little, people are going to lose faith in magic. We'll go through a whole series of uh, transitional phases, and eventually we're going to end up with enlightenment and then modern science, which believes in magic not at all or so the argument was. So the question then arises of all the people in the community, uh, who's the person that believes the most, which is to say who clings most tenaciously to the traditional belief in magic, and who is the person or who are the people that believe the least, who are quickest to abandon these traditional beliefs. Well, the key figure on which the, around which the debate will center is going to be the figure of the magician. So does the magician believe most or does the magician believe least? And you can imagine that there are reasons to think either one or the other. So, yeah, some people say, well, of course the magician believes the most. If he didn't believe, why would he be performing those rituals? And, um, well, there's uh, a number of reasons why he might do that, but uh, they're going to boil down to some form of credulity or the other. Um, but the other side of the argument would be, well, of course the magician believes the least, because He's the one, or she's the one, who knows how all of these uh, seeming magical acts are performed. You know, somebody can say, look, I've, I've got this, uh, who knows what, this noxious or this um, magical substance trapped in my arm, and for that reason it's paralyzed. I need you to come cure me. I need you to remove this uh, evil entity from my arm. So the magician's going to, uh, with his hand or with some instrument, uh, open up your arm and, and, and pull out uh, the harmful element, and then you can go your merry way. But uh, he knows perfectly well he's not actually opening up your arm. Uh, you know, that's not real blood, it's ketchup. Well, where did you get the, the, the ketchup? Well, I got it out of a little plastic package. Well, it's not just blood coming out of my arm, but there's also pus. Well, no, dude, that's not pus. That's horsey sauce, and I got it at Arby's, the same place I got the ketchup. So the, the magician doesn't believe. He, he knows exactly how all the tricks are done. Um, well, if he doesn't believe, why would he do it? And, of course, there's a number of reasons uh, we could offer forth. One is because he's simply cynical and wants to take advantage of the naivete and the credulity of uh, people who don't know as well as him. And you know, we could count countless examples of that. Uh, another reason might be because uh, he's paternalistic. So he knows this stuff doesn't work, but he's nevertheless going to perform it as a service to people who don't know as well because they simply don't have the wherewithal to manage their lives unless they are laboring under some 
uh, illusion which he's going to create for them for the greater good of the whole. So it's, yes, mendacious, but it's not cynical or opportunistic. It's, it's a kind of paternalistic benevolence. And another reason he might do it is why? because the community demands it of him and he's scared of what they might do to him if he refuses to cooperate. But in either case, the magician is the most believing or the magician is the least believing. And this is where most enters in the debate, which is one of the things that makes him so brilliant and influential. What he wants to argue is, um, well, identities, and here's a term that you guys will recognize from common parlance today, identities are not as fixed as people would like to believe. They may be more fluid than uh, previous uh, scholars on these matters had imagined. So, yeah, we need the role of a believer, and we need the role of a non-believer, but who occupies each of these two roles, that can change from time to time. So uh, we're all to one extent or another caught up in the same system, and the system may demand belief of others, but the system also needs what? People who are non-believers or dissenters, faithless, heretical, whatever you want to say, because it's those people who as the believers go about converting them and bringing them back into the fold or expelling them and saying, you're out, you don't get this, uh, that those who do the attempted conversion or who do the perform the excommunication are in the process of doing what? Consolidating their own beliefs. So we need both of these roles, the believers and the non-believers, in any community that's properly going to function and that's going to sustain itself. But for all that we need these roles, the people playing the roles, um, that can change from time to time. So all of us, to one extent or another, are fluctuating in and out of these two positions, oscillating from these two roles, though the person who will oscillate uh, in the most extreme fashion is going to be the magician. Why? Well, the magician knows that none of these rituals work because the magician knows all the tricks whereby people are fooled into believing that the magic does work. So no, the magician doesn't believe at all and you know, left to their own devices, they don't wanna go through this, it's a hassle. People call you in the middle of the night, make all kinds of demands upon you. No, no, no. I'm, but if the community demands powerfully enough, insistently enough, that uh, you will perform this ritual because we absolutely need it, because they, they're believers, then, you know, under threat of punishment or death, you're going to have to go through the motions. And so you will do what? Pick up your bag of tricks, maybe get your little apprentice or somebody like that, and go off at the behest, at the insistence of the community, and go through all the motions. But what happens as the magician begins to show this amulet, this talisman, say these magic words, uh, perform this magical gesture, is these powerful symbols, which cannot be used by all people and cannot be used even by the authorized people, except in the right time and places, they're thought to be very powerful. Uh, once these things are brought forth, the crowd will be struck by their appearance, struck by the performance that the magician performs with these very powerful words and objects and what have you, and they begin to go into a state of amazement. And so great is their state of amazement, and so collective is the nature of human action and, the hu and human consciousness that the magician cannot help when they see this sudden enthusiasm on the part of the audience, the magician cannot help but be seduced, 
duped, enchanted by their own spell, they become the greatest believer. And again, if you do a little bit of reflection, you can think of countless examples. So uh, roles are fixed within communities, but the person occupying those roles may change and, and will change from time to time. And it's the magician who is, if you will, that person who simultaneously believes the very least and the very most. And the name for this theory that uh, most develops is called functionalism. Functionalism refers to the roles that um, need to exist for a society to function properly uh, with the various bodies of which the society is composed of um, flowing if you will, or oscillating from one position to another. Okay, so that's a huge component of Moses' argument, and it's one that we're going to see in our next, uh, not set of readings, but reading. That's going to be by a guy named Leo Steinberg, who, who's writing on very, very different subject matter, but who's read very, very similar um, if not identical, background materials, and he's going to bring them to bear on some arguments that I think, I hope you'll find very interesting. Anyway, functionalism. Uh, moving from there, what I'd like to talk about is uh, what actually causes magic to work. So Mose is trying um, as best he can, along with a bunch of other people, uh, to figure out uh, how magic actually works or how people who perform, people who believe in magic actually think that it works, what makes the magic go. What we'll do then is, is look at the various components of magic and try to find the operative uh, principle or the, the source of the magic. And uh, this can be broken down into three different categories. And most will go into these with various levels of uh, sophistication, but I, I can name them very, very quickly for you. These are going to be formulae, these are going to be powers, and these are going to be demons. So let me go into those quickly. They're, they're not hard to understand. Uh, formulae or formulas uh, are all of the motions, all of the words that you say, all of the hocus pocus or whatever common phrase you want to use that you need to perform in order to make the magic work. Um, so yeah, lots of things are going on, but it really comes down to the formulas, the performances. Um, other people, when asked to identify where the magic really lies, what's most essential to it, they're going to say, no, 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 it's, it's the powers. Uh, powers, what do you mean by that? They're going to be certain invisible um, forces contained within material objects. And um, an example of this would be all kinds of traditional medicines that we see from various cultures from around the world, from every continent probably other than Antarctica because not a lot of magical societies living down there. Anyhow, um, so uh, you might think that, who knows what, this particular root uh, has um, some type of magical property contained in it because the shape of it looks very much like a man's body and so that's going to lend a certain kind of strength to you if you ingest it. Uh, other forms of traditional medicine, somebody wants to be all that on their wedding night and uh, they're a little nervous so they're going to do what? They're going to go out and poach a rhino, take the horn, grind it up into powder, eat it in the form of a capsule. Yeah, there's some type of force of virility supposed to be in the rhino horn, and that's going to be uh, the source of the magic. And then the third one would be demons. And by demons, we don't mean the sinister, whatever. Demons are just simply aerial spirits. The word comes from the Greek. Uh, it's spelled with an A-I, not an E. Um, and th these are spirits which can be invoked to do the magic. So we've got these three different options, and each one of these, according 
to whom you consult will be the principal, if not the exclusive source of the magic and everything else is just window dressing. Uh, but what Mose wants to argue is this. None of these uh, sources of magic would actually, could actually be the necessary and sufficient cause of the magic uh, to work because if it were then why would we need the other two? Why all the window dressing? And what he'll show in uh, description after description is even though somebody will say A, B, or C is what's actually doing the magic, they feel compelled to bring in the other two any way. And so what most is really coming to here is the conclusion that uh, we don't understand magic in the way that it operates. Because why? Because we're still trying to understand it in our terms rather than the terms of this society that either practices magic or believes in magic. Well, what, what prejudice could we possibly have? And for most, it's going to be all the uh, prejudices of uh, modern science, which is going to be um, the fundamental belief in the laws of mechanics that uh, A, cause yields this effect, which in turn becomes a cause and leads to that effect and the next and the next and the next. This is, again, what uh, Kant called a posteriori thinking. Um, things happen in a linear chain moving in one direction from the past through the present to the future. Um, and if we want to understand how this final result occurs, we need to do what? Break down the process into its individual components and see how they all add up to the larger whole. Uh, and for most, you know, this isn't how the world really works. It's the way the world has been understood to work after a certain moment in time, which took place early in the 17th century, and what is called the scientific revolution. We can do all kinds of things because we believe this way, but for most, uh, this is a prejudice of ours, it's a construct of ours, and if we really want to see how magic works, we need to move back behind our own way of viewing things. We need to, if only provisionally, set aside everything that we believe to be the case, and we need to try to put ourselves in the position of people who simply don't know modern science and don't see the world to operate the way that we do. Uh, if you look at the blog where I put up some uh, quotations by Christian Dior, the famous fabric designer, or fa fashion designer, and also by um, Marcel Mauss, uh, Mauss's quotation is, imagine if you possibly can, and then he's going to talk about the uh, way that m magic appears not uh, from our perspective looking in on it, but the way that it appears to the magician, we've got to get on the other side of that divide and see things in their terms, not our own. We have to stop imposing our prejudices onto them. So, uh, all right, how does the magical world view then? I think the best way to do this is, as I said, um, if our modern view of the world and causality, there's the word, is based on this law of cause and effect. Things don't simply happen, but A must bump into B so that B can absorb A's motion and transfer it onto C, which will in turn transfer it onto D, and then ball E can eventually fall into the hole on the billiard table. Um, if, if we can abandon that uh, view of cause and effect, then we might stand a chance, even if we don't get um, magic quite right, we'll at least free ourselves of our own prejudices. So uh, the easiest way to do that is simply to reverse the equation or to reverse time. Maybe it's not the case that A pushes into B, pushes into C, etc., etc., so that E can eventually be pushed into the hole on the billiard table, but maybe it's the case that the billiard table 
and its hole so wants to be filled with the ball that it will actually draw E into it. But E, in order to have the energy in order to move itself um, into the pocket in the billiard table, must do what? It must draw D, which must in turn draw C. So everything's moving from uh, this perspective, not from uh, past to future, but the future is actually reaching back into the past and pulling it into itself. This type of reversal will get us a long way toward beginning to see things uh, in terms of magic. So, you know, if you want to look at it in other terms, it, it's not because you are hungry and pick up milk and pour it onto a bowl of cereal that uh, suddenly the Cheerios start to rise. But it may well be that the Cheerios so desperately want to rise that they're actually going to pull you <laughs> toward filling up the bowl with milk. The Cheerios are making you hungry because they want to float. Uh, this is cause and effect in reverse. And this will get us closer to magic. It's not going to get us all the way there, but it'll get us a lot closer. Um, how can we get even closer? Well, it would be to see things happening neither past to future or future to past, but the term here would be we need to see things uh, simultaneously. So here's an example of what I mean. Uh, say we're living in a society which has a tribal chief or something like that and as a representative of our community, um, his well-being and our well-being are intimately tied with one another. If he's having a bad day, we're having a bad day. And uh, he is having a bad day. Why? Because his young son, in whom he is greatly invested as his heir, um, has fallen from a tree and has broken his arm. And uh, until this kid is feeling better, the chief isn't going to feel better, and everybody's going to have a hard time. Everything's all wrong. Um, and so we've got to get this situation uh, solved as quickly as we can. So we're going to do what? We're going to call in the magician and we're going to ask him to please heal this young kid's arm. We go to the magician's house in the middle of the night and he doesn't believe any of this stuff. He's done it a million times. He's not just tired because it's three o'clock in the morning and you know, he's in his undies and he's already had six beers, but he's, he's bored. He's disillusioned. None of this, none of this matters to him anymore, but he can't say no. He can't say no because the community demands it of him. So he's going to do what? All right. All right. Here I come. He's going to grab his bag of tricks with everything that he needs to work magic. He's going to get his little apprentice, because every sorcerer has an apprentice, and they're going to go off to see this kid. Uh, they find the kid, and thank God it's not a compound fracture. It's just what they call a green stick fracture. Young people can get this because their bones are still somewhat supple. Um, so it's kind of bent, but it's still uh, connected to a certain extent. So what's the magician going to do? Because he has to, he's going to reach into his bag and he's going to get a stick that, again, is broken in two, though there's a little something connecting it. Um, and he's going to hand this over to his apprentice. The apprentice is going to hold the stick on either side of the break. The magician's going to put his hands on either side of the break in the kid's arm. And he's going to say, abracadabra, hocus pocus, one, two, three, and whoosh, now, if we believe things operate, or if we want to see things the way that Western, modern, cause and effect science uh, sees them, then we're going to say what? Uh, it's the stick that is causing the arm to straighten. Um, now, we moderns are not going to believe that there's any supernatural force that can allow a stick 
to straighten an arm. But uh, what certain people prior to most were arguing in a patronizing way is that, well, these people are pretty ignorant, but we'll give them credit. At least they've got the most basic premises of modern science down, which is the law of cause and effect. Uh, we take for granted, or they take for granted, that there are certain powers, properties, demons, whatever, or formulae, which uh, are efficacious. Um, now, all of us moderns know that's garbage, but at least they believe that what? To do this with the stick will cause that to happen. So ignorant as they are, at least they've got this very basic proto-science under control. Um, Mos doesn't want to patronize these archaic people and say they're just dumber versions of us, though they'll eventually, after thousands of years, arrive at our position of enlightenment. He wants to take them on their own terms, not impose our terms onto them. And so he's going to say, well, maybe it's not that the stick is setting the arm, maybe it's the arm that's setting the stick as a way of externally expressing in the visible world what we can't see in the invisible world because the break is hidden beneath the surface of the skin. So it's actually the arm that's causing the stick to manifest that the setting or the healing has taken place. That's a little bit different, but it's still insufficient because it's just it re reversing the equation of the same old cause and effect relationship. And so what Mose is going to say is this. It's not that the arm is setting the stick. It's not that the stick is setting the arm. If you really want to understand magic, it's that the two happen simultaneously. And if words are involved, or if powers are involved, or if demons are involved, they happen to be participating in this same moment of healing all at the same time. Everything happens at once. We can, as moderns, analyze this down into its part after the fact, but it's not that the parts build up to a whole. It's that the whole can be analyzed into parts. Um, but no matter how we try to break the part, the whole down into its parts, and say this, as a matter of fact, is where the magic um, actually originates. Uh, we always have to bring in the others. So this notion of simultane simultaneity is, for most, what magic is all about. Uh, things don't happen for a reason. Things simply happen. And uh, the experience of the world simply being what it is, simply doing what it does, this is what we call magic. That is to say, in so many words, that uh, magic, as a matter of fact, is just another word for human consciousness. Magic is the most original way that we experience the world, and magic is a social ritual. Uh, what this essentially means to say is that uh, there is no such thing as individual human consciousness. Uh, there's no such thing as the human mind existing in perfect isolation. So if you think back to Rene Descartes, whom I mentioned earlier, the founder of uh, mechanical philosophy and this law of cause and effect, you know, his whole philosophy reduces or, 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 or derives from his original uh, ineluctable and undeniable insight, which is, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. Uh, and he's able to discover that the one undeniable fact is that he himself exists. Um, and the reason he's able to get rid of all of the other distractions which have been preventing him from having this absolutely fundamental insight is uh, distractions from the outside world. Uh, so for Descartes, uh, it is not just possible, but if you want to think clearly, it's necessary to believe that the entire world can exist or that you can experience reality, that consciousness can exist in a state of pure isolation.
You can be you. You can think what you think. You can do what you do, and you don't need anybody else to help you. As a matter of fact, all they'll do is distract you. And this is exactly what most wants to refute. Um, there's no such thing as individual consciousness. Uh, all forms of human consciousness must take place in a social setting. Now, people will believe that they're autonomous individuals, but uh, let me contend, and as we shall see in the future, uh, all kinds of evidence, both clinical and everyday, will indicate to us again and again and again, as, as soon as you think you're an autonomous individual, only one tiny thing needs to happen and immediately you're caught back up in collective consciousness, collective activity, collective passion. Uh, even if those collective phenomena take the form of debate over whether or not the magic does work or doesn't work. Um, one of the things you'll remember from earlier into the article is that uh, just because uh, a magic spell doesn't work, that's no reason for people to stop believing in magic in general because they believe in magic a priori. If the spell doesn't work, it's not because magic is fake. It's because the magician uh, performed his ritual wrong and so he's going to have to do it again. Uh, it may be that one of us is not believing hard enough and so we're going to have to find that person out. How? With magic. Or it may be that another wizard has done what? Cast a counter spell, and we're going to have to find a way to counter the counter spell. So the failure of magic, as a matter of fact, is absolutely essential to the continuance of magic in the same way that non-believers are absolutely essential to the maintenance of orthodox belief and orthodox practice. <music>